<laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm very old school, okay? So, don't expect any PowerPoint or any elaborate uh, gizmo because my reckoning is that the more PowerPoints I have, the worse I become, right? Because I'll be reading through the slides and not looking at you and interacting with you. So, if you are looking for PowerPoints, uh, my apologies, all right? But wait another 50 years, I promise you, I will learn how to use the PowerPoint. <laughs> Seriously, seriously. Anyway, uh, while, the gets up, uh, sure. while the technology gets in the way, let me say good morning to you. Uh, so thank you for having me. And I beg your indulgence and being patient with me because sometimes I do get carried away, right? Uh, and the modifications, uh, minor corrections. I'm not just with the uh, business school in Singapore, but I'm also a director of research at the uh, Logistics Institute, so I do a lot of uh, research in my uh, other half of my life at the university. The research that I do uh, touches a very close to the industry uh, simply because I've worked in the industry before, right? I used to uh, manage uh, 25 countries in the uh, Asia, Middle East, right? Looking at the uh, supply chain solutions. So that was my past life. So, and right now, uh, today, what I will do is uh, two things. More importantly is to try and answer your questions, uh, but I don't claim that I have uh, all the answers to your questions, as you can see, right? This is the most important technology for me, right? Yeah, which is also a reason why they invented PowerPoint, because they reckon that, you know, if, if everyone of us is going to have this technology, then it's going to be very heavy, right? But of course, you know, with this, you never get sick because you're always exercising constantly. Right, with PowerPoint, I'm not sure. Okay, so back back to where, where I was going to say. So what I would do? Sure, sure. Okay, now which way do I start? I know there are only two ways to do it. Okay, okay. Yeah, do you? Uh, you guys are very high tech. Okay, okay, sorry, sir. I, I, I am not one of those who will sell all those MLM things, okay? So, so please forgive me. Oh, there's somebody at the back. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay, thanks. I'm very comfortable when you're here. Okay. <laughs> Otherwise, this thing doesn't work, then I'm in trouble again. Okay, um, so what about... Oh, okay. Uh, ah, okay, okay, that one, yeah, yeah. Otherwise... Okay, so, like I was saying, so, uh, my, my task today is not to go and give you a whole... I think, what, it's uh, 20 minutes that you're having. Is it 20 minutes lecture? Wow, okay, thank you. <laughs> See, see, you guys are, are well prepared, much more prepared than I. Okay, thanks. Okay, so how much time do I have this morning? Ah, oh, so short, huh? <laughs> okay, okay, fine, no problem. Uh, let me see, time now is uh, okay. We'll go for this, shall we? Okay, yeah, we just, we just aim for that, huh? Because uh, there's a good reason behind that also, because... Uh, I have to catch a plane again, right? So I cannot miss my plane. Otherwise, tomorrow my client will be upset at me, most upset at me. Okay. Um, no, sorry. Yes. So I intend to use this time to do a few things. One, okay, if I may just park the agenda here for us to see. I guess uh, what you want to do is to talk about this this magic word, right? Second is, I will talk about the whole journey, and perhaps relate to you my perspective because each of us, our, our journey, our perspectives will be different, right, based on our previous experience or our past life. Third, maybe to encourage you or whatever, right, to highlight about the pitfalls and challenges, right, that will exist. Right? By the way, you don't have to copy all this, okay? I'm going to make a very interesting, uh, simple suggestion to you. And the suggestion is very simple. This activity of copying, you should outsource, right? In all good logistics practice, you should outsource this to one person in the classroom who's the fastest copier and who is the most accurate copier. Then you pay him a little premium and ensure you get quality for work. Then you can all listen 
and enjoy the first class seat that you're sitting on. Okay, so that, that's where you make money for everybody. And the guy who's being outsourced to is very happy because then he's got a new job in case he doesn't want to do a PhD. Okay, then what I will do, and I think in your folder I've got, I think I put in a couple of papers, okay? Two papers where we will then dissect and discuss. Right. More importantly, discuss about the review process. Right, because this is the one that makes or breaks your uh, research career. Okay, then once that's done, the last item for this meet today's meeting is actually the AOB. Okay, so if there are any questions, anything they have not covered in the first four points, do feel free to just ask. Okay, second thing is now, uh, for this 90 minutes as you know, uh, 90 minutes can be a very short time or can be a very long time. For me, 90 minutes is actually very long, right? Usually, my presentations are 20 minutes. Why? For a simple reason. I have a challenge beyond 20 minutes, and the challenge is as follows. I have to try very hard to keep awake. Right? So you've got to help me to help you. Right? And the way you can help me to help you is to as we go along, please feel free to ask questions. Right? The more you ask, the easier for me to share with you because I really don't know what you don't know. Right? And only you know what you don't know. True? Yeah, so that's the best. Okay, so if you can, ask questions along the way, any point. Just throw some things. I'll be happy to uh, touch base with you. Well, not so fast. Huh? This one doesn't scare you. It's okay. So, uh, uh, I don't want to scare them yet. Okay, yeah. Okay, let's go to the first. Is it okay, guys? Okay. So far up to now, who does not understand what I've said? If you find that I'm too fast, right, slow me down. If you find that you cannot understand what I said, let me know and I'll change to another dialect of English, which I've yet to decide. Is it okay? A little bit slow down. Okay, slow down. Huh? So, very simple, young lady. If you look at me, you cannot understand, then you do three things. One, open your eyes big, right? I look lost. If I still cannot see you, then you do the next stage. You put your hand on your chin like that, right? And I still cannot see you, you let go of the tripod, you fall your head on the table, then everybody wakes up, then I promise you, I will notice you. Is that okay? Okay, fine. See, see, okay, okay. My, 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 all my technologies are, are being moved away, right? So strange, yeah? okay. So suddenly I feel so, wow, bad, bad, bad. For want of a better word, okay. Okay, fine, let's go back to this one. Research. I assume why we are here today is because of this, isn't it? Now, can someone tell me what you understand by this? Two, four, six, eight letter word. By the way, this, this eight letter word, don't believe what the Chinese says. Uh. The eight is a, is a good number, it's the best number. It's not true, okay? Because this eight letter word is not a number that can make you money. If anything, this eight letter word is a number that will make you lose money. Right? And I'm serious about that because you don't just lose money as in this one, but you also lose money as in this one. True? Huh? I speak from the heart, huh? it's very realistic, okay? Because anyone tells you so you can make money here, it's like me asking you to go and buy the lottery, and tomorrow I guarantee you will strike, you should know you will not strike. Right? Because if you strike, you won't be here today. Okay, so can someone tell us, what do you understand by this? What is your version of this eight letter word? Hey, by the way, yeah. okay, first I'll tell you first, okay? There's no price here from me, yeah, if you get it right or wrong, okay? Right, so don't have to worry that you get a lousy price from me. No, 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 I got no price today, as you can see. I only came in that bag and I'm going back in that bag, that's all. Right, so no price, huh? but it's just make friends with me, okay? All right, anybody who's brave enough to answer my question? No one? Yes. By the way, you must be a student to qualify first. You know why? Not? Because once you ask, I tell you, all the students will keep quiet. Then they start copying what you say. Then because they think your faculty, whatever you say, whatever we say must be correct, right? Then you copy, you know. Then worst part, you know what? After they copy, you go outside and say, my teacher told me this, so it must be correct. Then you say, hey, what did your teacher tell you? The guy will say, my teacher didn't tell you anything. Well, then you say, hmm, the teacher not good. My teacher told me everything. Right? Which is not true, huh? Everything might not be everything correct. True or not? 
Okay, fine. Okay, anyway, I will to you, sir. Uh, just one will like in depth analysis. In depth analysis, wow, so deep. Uh. Okay, sorry. Uh. In depth analysis. Okay, I, I'm a bit crude as a person. Okay, whenever I see the word analysis, uh, sometimes I know it makes people very anal you know, about it. Right? Because you know why? You can analyze till the cows come home. Right? And you still find nothing, you know, and then tell about the same thing. I'll give you an example, okay? Uh, who likes coffee here in this room? Ah, see, these are honest people, right? Uh? But what did the doctors tell you? Is it good or bad for health? Some say good, some say bad, right? So what's the last research on coffee? Serious? I'm dead serious. What's the last research on coffee? Is it good or bad or ugly? <laughs> Tasty. <laughs> okay, okay. Make coffee is not a universal drink. I accept it. Now, who likes who takes eggs every day? Eggs. Anybody? As in chicken eggs or whatever. Do you all take eggs? No, yeah, not every day. Why? Because research says what? Cholesterol. Why not? They say you cannot take more than three eggs a day. My wife told me that for twenty years, and every day in twenty years, I argue with her. Because I said, I need my egg because my mother told me must take an egg every day. It's good for you. But my wife says, no. She says, the doctor says, no more than three. So every time I ask an egg, an egg, right, she will look at me and say, okay, fine. Someone cooks the egg, she takes the egg away, right? I can't get to eat. I look at the egg, I get upset. She said, no problem, you get yourself tomorrow. But I told her, I want my egg fresh. Then no, it's okay. That egg will be for you tomorrow, not today. Because you've done your quota yesterday. Oh, it just gets upset. Why? Because of this word, isn't it? Research today says what? For eggs. In the past was what? They said, doctor says, don't not to have an egg every day because your cholesterol is bad for you. And guess what? Today, the most recent research says that having eggs is good. All of a sudden, you're not crazy, right? right? So now what does that mean? Do I have to go and make up for the lost eggs in the last 20 years? Three times, uh, right? A week, right? So three times 52 weeks times 20. Oh, it's scratching my head. Now, let me see. Let me see. Yeah. Let me try and work it out. 3 times 52 times 20. 3 because 3, 3 times a week. There are 52 weeks in a year, 20 years. Right now. So, that is how many? Yeah? Wow, goodness. 3,000 eggs, man. I think if I eat one shot, 3,000 eggs, I will die. Right now, huh? This is really high protein feed, really. Automatically die. Okay? So, what does that mean? It means this. Some jokers have gone in, in the case of eggs, okay? A simple thing. To have done a in depth research and analyze it to the cows come home, literally. But to say that, hey, there's one verdict out there that from research, established research, well, no, of course, I must be very careful here. I'm using very challenging words. Okay. Um, these are the four words that usually you will see uh, when we talk about doing research. The first one is that research must be established, established as in, it must be established by respectable institutions or respectable scholars, right? So sometimes you find that, hey, you know, what makes you say that your research is acceptable to the layman? For example, the case of eggs. It's because they say some famous doctor in Harvard says so, right? Then after, guess what? All the companies that are trying to sell the eggs to so markets say this is a good egg because it's a low, no cholesterol egg and has been certified good based on the research by X and X or so and so author. Right? They will say this is from whatever university. Right? The better the name, the more credible the research, the research and the more you're likely to believe it. Right? But is that true? Okay, is that true? Right? So established, reputable, comprehensive, and thorough. Of course, if I told you that question, how do you tell whether egg, taking an egg every day is good or bad for you? How do you make sure that it is thorough? How do you make sure it is comprehensive? Right? I guess one way to do is to allow a guinea pig subject to sit 
take the egg every day, monitor him for the rest of his life, and put another one to say, okay, you can only take three eggs a day, right? Or three eggs a week, and then monitor him for the rest of his life. And the one whoever knocks off first will be the one that's proven correct or otherwise, isn't it? But of course, in my case, I'll volunteer to take an egg a day. Lah. But my wife will say, no, you know, you cannot qualify, right? Because you say, you know, you can only take three a week. So tough, right? I choose to be a subject for one experiment. But my wife will say, otherwise, you can only be a subject of the other experiment. No. But if you look at it carefully, what am I saying? For it to be comprehensive and thorough most times today, right? You have to follow through the lifespan. And we can't afford that, right? And because we can't afford that, that creates, that creates a lot of what we call Right? Validity and reliability issues. And that's why when you study your course on research methods, one of the things your instructor would have told you is, hey, how do you make sure the questions that you ask are valid for the experiment? How do you make sure after you ask those questions, right? How do you make sure that they are reliable enough for people to believe them, isn't it? Right? Because you can sample and you can choose a convenient sample such that you get the results that you want to hear and say, oh, this is what it is, I published. And that's exactly what happens in the case of coffee and eggs. Right, where some, some scientists will say, oh, I've done this test, I've done it, but then they say, oh, but you already did it in the US. Right, so it's not valid. Or they say, okay, coffee. Why do you do coffee in a coffee-drinking country? You say, oh, if you do coffee in a coffee-drinking country like Italy, definitely they say coffee is good for you. But if you do coffee in a non-coffee-drinking country, for example, like India or parts of China, then they say, hey, tea is better, isn't it? Less harmful. And they give you all sorts of reasons. They even tell you, you know, how to make the tea without the caffeine. Right? They say, don't jiggle the tea bag. And you wonder, what, is, what does that mean? Right? So, strange ways of doing research, but research is about ensuring that what you've done can be replicated. And if somebody were to reproduce it in another form, it should not change, as in it can be reproducible easily and the research the results that you get must be reputable now um if you look at the three r's that's linked to the word research actually none of it matters except this one true right reputable that's the most important because in research, in the world of research, it's the worst world to be in. If you think you're in corporate life, it's backstabbing. But I'll tell you, actually, corporate life is the easiest life because it's only Monday to Friday, it's over, forget it, tell your boss, don't call me, I'll call you on Monday. But of course, no, don't, don't try that, okay? Don't try that. That's what I'm saying only, yeah? If you think you lose your job, don't say I say this, okay? Just remember that, yeah? You must be very careful. But I used to do that, okay? I used to do that, I tell my boss. Hey, I work for you like a dog from Monday to Friday, right? 8 to 12 or 8 to 9 or whatever. Then when it comes to weekend, I work for my wife like a dog. Okay? Eh, for the Saturday and Sunday. So I tell my boss, don't call me, okay? Because if you call me, I'll tell your wife that you are spoiling my life. And then let the wife do the husband, isn't it? That's easier. But seriously, guys, what I'm saying is this one. The reputation, okay, if you like... Okay. The reputation of your research becomes very important. One, it's very difficult to get the first paper out. We all agree, isn't it? It's a real challenge, especially for those of us who are uninitiated. You write your first paper, you really don't know where to start and say, what the heck am I doing? Then you start to question, why am I doing this research? You know? Well, it's so simple, right? right for example, uh, let me ask you a question. Very simple question. Okay. Why should... The ringgit be a rectangular piece of paper. Simple. Seriously, it's a research question, right? Now. Right? Why should the ringgit be a rectangular piece of paper? Why? Anyone? Ever thought about that? Or oh, you might think I'm crazy enough to ask that dumb question, right? You got better things to do with your life than think about this at night before you sleep. I do, by the way. But then I can't sleep. I wake up again and think about it. I don't know. Then I tell my wife, she calls me and says, "You're going to sleep, or you want me to sleep first? 
So I tell her, okay, okay, I'll stay with you now. Seriously, no? my wife thinks I'm, I'm cuckoo, huh? Yes, hey, but back to my question. Why is the ringgit a rectangular piece of paper? Why? Oh, see, actually, no, not true, you know. The wallet was designed for the ringgit, not the other way around, right now. Ah, see, that's a very good point. Why? Because now, you see, you're looking at the process of research, process and outcome. Right? So your question, my friend, is that you said the wallet came first. Hence, you do a research to say, how do you make money to fit into the wallet, right? It's a design issue, right? From an engineer's perspective, it's a design issue. But I'm asking a question. Why must the ringgit be a rectangular piece of paper? Because if the ringgit were round, guess what happened to your wallet? Would you have a wallet? Of course, you say it's like crazy. Lah. If it's round, it'd be a coin, right? Cannot be a ringgit anymore. True enough. Right? It'd be a coin. Then you don't have a wallet. You have a money or a coin pouch, right? Or a money pouch, isn't it? So, even here, okay, if you can think and suggest to your government and your policy makers, why can't I have a square? Why can't I have this? Why can't I have this? Okay, fine. Okay, fine. We have one more. Okay. Why not? It's so long as legal tender, it fits the bill, it should do the purpose, isn't it? It's fit for use. But why must the ringgit be a rectangular piece of paper? And then guess what? Which this, by the way, is a valid question, okay? Come, governments have asked this question and say, how big should this rectangular piece of paper be? How big should a ringgit paper be? How big? Anyone? How big as in should? A one dollar bill be smaller than a ever thought of that? Or should all of them be the same? Because the cost of printing each one of these is the same. Right? Well, you're awfully silent. I have only gathered three things, okay? One is that either you think I'm crazy, or four things now, okay? Either you think I'm crazy, two, you really are seriously thinking about my crazy question, or three, you might ask, what the heck is he talking about? Right? He's really out of this world, he's from Mars and we're on Earth, right? It's always been like that, right now. We've always been using currency this way. Or four, you think, hey, maybe I can write a paper out of this. Sure, no. So they're all crazy papers, crazy research, that's what I'm saying. Right? But back to my question. So, how? Why must the ringgit be a rectangular piece of paper? Answer the first one. Then we go down to the second one and say, should they be of the same size? Then we can go on further to another question, right, related to the ringgit and the dollar. Isn't it? Right? Now, what am I going through? I'm going through the whole process of research with you, in a sense. Isn't it? Right? right. Getting you to think, getting you to question, getting you to conceptualize all this. Simple examples, but it's practicable. And that's what it is about research. It doesn't have to be so theoretical, so high level that you become totally confounded. You cannot even relate to the subject matter, which I'll come to in one of my points later. Anyway, back to my question. So, why should the ringgit be a rectangular piece of paper? Anybody? I tell you what, if you can answer my question, i give you a dog gift, okay? I got one bottle here, which I was going to drink. <laughs> but I'll use it as an incentive to entice you to answer <laughs> before I drink it. <laughs> yes? Hello? Anyone home? Anyone? Come on, don't be shy. Yeah, by the way. No right or wrong answers, I told you, Mike. Huh? Sessions, okay? Anyone? Yes. I thought the young lady was going to take my door prize, but she did not choose to. Okay, fine. I came here to go to give her. Yes, sir. Mm hmm. Okay. Very good. Wait, wait, let me put this back here. Okay, reserve this dog. I can't give to you because I just opened the cap. So, quality assurance is not there already. Okay. So. 
is rectangular. Now you're right because from a uh, product optimization, okay, that's what we call it in my space. Product optimization means what? In storage and warehousing, for example. Okay, this is the most compact form, right? So research tells you, right, it's easier to store things which are in a certain configuration compared to a circle, a rhombus, or a, uh, or a triangle. But you've not answered my question, actually, but you've just said that, yes, having a regular form, four sides, is always easier to store. It's compact. But my question was, why must it be a rectangular piece of paper? Because you've answered this, you've answered this, you've answered this, but you have not answered this. Right? right? And the this is what? Why can't I store it? Why can't I cut the paper as a square and call it a one dollar note also, isn't it? It's also a productive way of most efficient way of storing it. Right? True? Yeah, it is. So that's what we're talking about. Understanding the process, you see. Now, having said that, uh, some of you probably were not born. Right? That was in the Japanese occupation in Malaysia. Guess what? They also have the dollar, isn't it? Right? But their dollar is a very small one, isn't it? Right? I used to collect, I don't know where, maybe the rest ate it or something. Right? They're very small, right? and it's a dollar. So, now, back to the next question. Which is related to these two guys. How big should the piece of paper be if it's rectangular? See what I'm doing through? I'm going through the top process of doing the research review. Right? Simple things like that where we don't think through. And I'll tell you the answer to this. The answer is very simple. The policy makers have said, okay, so that's because one country started the dollar, which in this case was the US. Everybody followed suit. Right? And it became rectangular for a simple reason. Now, but we have not addressed the question of size of the currency. Right? Because first question was why rectangular? Second question was, this is A, if you like. Second question of B in the process was, should you have bigger papers to denote different levels of currency? Isn't it? Now, let me ask you a question. Should a $100 note be bigger than a $1 note? Yes or no? Why? Yeah, easy, you know what? Okay, that's a very interesting one. Right? Observation, anecdotal, you can, you can collect data on this, okay? You can do your own survey also, right? There's a piece of empirical work down there. But you can collect your own data and do an anecdotal survey and say that, hey, is it really easy? And I'll tell you, most people will tell you this, right? Perception is what? Yeah. Bigger it is, the more important it is, right? So hence, we see a bigger piece of paper, you take note more than a smaller piece of paper. Hence, typically the $1 is smaller than the $100 bill. But you know what happens today? There are some countries, we won't mention name except the dollar note is green, Right? There are some countries in this world that has got a policy to say that if I'm storing this in a more compact way, most uniform way, guess what? I do not want to disturb my warehousing. I do not want to disturb my size dimensions and utilization. So what do they do? They have a policy that the $1, the $50, the $10 and whatever, $100, they're all the same size. They're all the same color. You know which country I'm talking about? Yes? Who said what? Who said what? Oh, who said that? Come on, be brave. Raise your hands. Yeah, see? It's true, isn't it? Right? So, see what I'm saying? This is actually a practical problem. Now, earlier one of you mentioned, because it's rectangular, because you want to make sure that it's the easiest way, the most economical way to store and warehouse it. But, if we have, and we all know in warehousing, if we put in different... Or you bring different products with different dimensions, then you can readjust your warehousing space, right? It's always easy to have the same dimension. So you don't have to think about the storage space anymore, just store it in. But of course, the other issue is what? You got to make sure that you can recognize, right? Do you do not want to give away what? A $50 bill thinking that it's a $5, right? That's true, right? That's true, okay, because I've done it before. All right? So later, don't ask me to give you money, okay? Now, so this is what it is. Now, but, what has it got to do? Research. Research will say, okay, 
in trying to determine the difference between B and C, what do we do? There are many ways to cut this research, isn't it? One is to go and inspect all the 216 countries in the world today and say, what currencies do they actually use? Try not, right? And then compare the thing, measure that, hey, this is a piece of paper. Okay, so another piece of paper. This is a piece of research output, right? Because this has to do with the outcome that I wrote down there. It's a piece of research outcome. And the outcome will be important because you can tell the world, hey, actually, you're not economical. You're not efficient in what? In your storage and production of the currency. Second, notice, in trying to distinguish some of these here, the $1 and $100, what do they do? It's not just by size, but some countries have also done it by... What else? Color, right? By color. And guess what? The US has got only one color, right? It's called the green bag. Whether it's $1 green bag, $10 green bag, it doesn't matter. It's still the green bag. Now, let me ask you a question. Why do they do that? Why? Why only one color? But different faces, okay? Different faces, different presidents, isn't it? Now, why? Whereas in your currency here, in Malaysia, it's what? Different color, different faces, different sizes. Product. So you have three levels of complexity, and we all know in a supply chain game, right? Having more of this creates create issues in variety and complexity, right? In terms of storage and control. Now let me tell you, in the case of the US, they wanted the same same colors because they found out that they want to appeal to people who are color blind. Compare the US, for example. This is what we do the process and the outcome, right? Compare the US and Australia, for example. Australia's colors are different. Not the currencies. And for those who are familiar with it, hey, guess what? Some people get confused by that. Why? Because they cannot tell the difference in the colors. There are a whole lot of challenge now. So what does that mean? It means that from a production perspective, okay, from a product optimization production perspective, using multi colors is not as good as using one color, right? Because of reason of cost. Very simple. That's all. Right. So you see, just a one simple currency perspective, you can actually streamline a lot of research around it no. but what am i saying here back to this question research what is it really if you look at this whole aspect of currency then research would have been to be able to first search search for what to search for the topic that you would like to do such a topic that's interesting to tell the world right now because at the end of the day nobody in this world will want to know why my wife says that i can only have three eggs a week so, right? but if i tell you that hey let's do a piece of work on saying why must the currency be of this form and post the following research questions and try and answer the three research questions here a b and c right then people want to maybe there may be people in the world who want to read this isn't it Right? Maybe right. put in a journal such as banking or finance, right? right? There may be a possibility, right? So, what am I saying? I'm saying that you've got to search for it, and then after you've done it, you've got to then do your due diligence. By having to research it. Now, what does research mean in this case? To research and say that, hey, better make sure whatever you write is interesting enough for the world to see and tell the world. Otherwise, you end up doing a piece of work that what's what I call trivial question. Basically saying that hey, you wasted one year, two years, three years of your life looking at something that's so mundane to the point where fine. The most you get people who will read is not your wife, you'll be the two or three reviewers, yourself, the editor. So that's about five already. And if you are if you are lucky, then your poor student will be unlucky. Because then he'll be forced to read your paper and give some comments. And he has to try and make some intelligent sense of a non-intelligent question. Understand? That's why I call a trivial question. Okay, so be careful of this. Research can take many, many forms. And some are interesting, some has basically has got very challenging processes, it means very difficult to do, and some, maybe the outcomes are not 
that clean because it could be very messy. There's no outcome in the case of coffee, in the case of eggs. We are still be debating, you know, the story of eggs and coffee, by the way, has been researched on for the last 30 years and no one has come to a verdict. You know why I suspect I've got a little conspiracy theory there. My first conspiracy theory is this. Therefore, eggs, I think, okay, the egg farmers must have paid the researchers, right, to say the right things. True? The egg farmers must have paid the researchers to say the right thing. And by the way, this does happen huh, in some countries. The second conspiracy theory is this. Sometimes, the scientists and researchers couldn't find any conclusion, but because they spent two, three, four, five years of their life sitting down in a lab, having no social life, right, and counting their opportunity costs, guess what they will do? They say, hey, my boss says, my system tells me, I must write a paper by this year. If I don't write by this year, what happens? I perish, right? Right, so what do they do? They start, what? Come on, you know the, you know the answer just as well as you. They start doing what? What, what? What? Don't worry, don't be shy. I'm, I'm a bit hard of hearing as you can see, right? Manipulate, no, nah, not so like that. Very, very long word, very hard to understand. They start doing some creative researching. Right? They start doing some creative researching and say, okay, this number is 0 0.01. Okay, okay, like it's there, but not, not conclusive enough, not, not, not strong enough, not statistically strong. So what do they do? They say, what if I make a mistake and add one more zero? So instead of saying 0 0.01, it becomes 0 0.001. Then after that, they say, heck. One zero more doesn't harm. Add one more zero. Why? Because who can ever say the difference between 0 0.001 and 0 0.0001? We're hard to see, right? That's how, by this second conspiracy theory, you find that many research papers go slip through the net. Right? Because we are not strict about the research method that's used. True? We're not strict. We don't even validate every part of the process that is involved here. And I'll tell you why. Because reviewers are also today inundated with so many papers. Right? And as a reviewer, what gets my goat is this. Pardon the, pardon the pun on the goat. What gets my goat is this. I get a letter, an email from the editor or the editorial office. Say, Can you help us to research, uh, review this paper and see whether it's suitable for publication? So I said, fine. Then after they got this fine by byline, you know, fine print, you know, they never tell you. you know. Hey, fine, please. Can you get it done within seven days? Oh, I look at the guy and say, Wow, man, you don't pay me. I do service for you. You expect to be done in seven days. But I also got to do my own research in seven days and get it published right now. So what does that mean? I'm, telling, I'm trying to tell the guy, you know. In fact, I did write the email, okay? I'm trying to tell the guy, hey, look, the lead time for me to produce a paper, at least in its final draft, is definitely more than seven days. But yet, you want me to review something for you in seven days so that the other guy can, can get his paper published. I said, this is not fair, right? And of course, the editorial office has got no reply for me yet. But however, the practice still stands. It means you do one of those paper reviews, right? they'll tell you seven days if possible reply, or if not, one month. But this is crazy because there's no, right? Unless, uh, what? A mass user of papers, which does happen, okay? Okay, so research. Now, any questions about this topic called research? Anyone? Anything that I, you think that I have, or anything that you want to add or comment on, or anything they want me to clarify on research? But I just want to hold to one point, okay? You are in it here for research, not for the money, because if it's for the money, you should not be here. Second is that count your opportunity cost, because once you get in, don't complain, huh? it's just like a loveless marriage. Right? Don't complain, okay? Because you've got to be happy already after that. Even when you're not happy, you still put a smile. Yes. Come on. Any 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 comments, reactions, responses? Hey, you must help me along, huh? Because it Serious, uh? Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, okay. But I, I, that's a small suggestion, okay? Tonight, when you go back, don't say that I told you this to your wife, okay? <laughs> After the next time I come, I'll tell your wife will claw me. I'll be finished, man. 
Okay, ready. But have a thought about it. Huh? So the points that I, wrote, um, that I wrote on the board, they're all there. I mean, maybe uh, I didn't say so much in so many words, but you can find in any research methods book or whatever, or your PhD journey, right? They will all talk about it in one form or another, right? But I'm just telling you that, hey, it's not as simple as you think it is. But yet, at the same time, don't be too envious. You find that there are cases where people actually can write papers like nothing, nobody's business, right? And you ask yourself a question, how is it they can think about it and I don't think about it? Or I've not thought about it, right? And this simple example like coffee, like even, you know, the dollar bill or the currency. Very simple thing like this. And this is what picks the interest, you know. And you do this, I'll tell you, there are journals, in fact, you know, in fact, what's, what's the irony, you know? The good, 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 good journals, right? They don't want you to write about so minute detail things. They want you to write about big picture things. You know, what are the good, good journals, okay? Uh, where can I write this? See now this? Nature, science, plus one. Okay? These are the good ones. Why? Because they're not even written like a journal. These journals are written like a newspaper report. Like, for example, in Nature, six, seven pages as of. Then you say, what are we doing, man? Here we got one school of thought saying that the journal papers must be at least so many words. But yet there's another school of thought saying, hey, you can't go beyond seven pages because why? Our journal must also consider the work of other people. It cannot be just your work and occupy the whole issue of that journal, isn't it? Right? So they say, if you can't limit yourself to seven pages, you can't tell the work what you're doing in seven pages, then you're not worth telling. And we don't want to put you up there to tell the work. Right? That's what it is. So you see, different schools of thought inside here. Okay. But just have a look at that. All right. Now, let me go on to the next one. The research journey. Tell me. What should the journey of research be like? What is your understanding of the, your research journey? What's your experience now? Share with me. Okay, don't worry about your professors here. Pretend that you have already told them before. They know your pains. Right? You know, you know doing research right, is just like buying SAP. You know what? You know what's SAP, right? What is it? What is SAP? But did you introduce SAP to them? Did they come in and give a talk? Yeah. Oh. Oh, good, good, good. So now we can say something about them, right? You know, it's SAP, right? You buy SAP, then you say, this is the start of my suffering and pain. Yeah, because you have to change your mode of doing things, isn't it? And then once you buy, you're stuck with it because you can't change anymore. It's too expensive to change the process, isn't it? Right? So that's why suffering and pain. Huh? But don't tell them that because then they give you the whole German spiel of what SAP means. And up to now, I still cannot pronounce it. Okay, so please, I need your inputs. How is your journey like for research now? Anything to share? Any pain point? Any, any issues? As you can see, I'm not very good at opening the okay, okay. Yes, anyone? Don't worry about your professors here. I'm sure they are open-minded enough to take criticism with a pinch of salt, provided it is good and constructive. Like they say, you know, what happens in this four walls stays in these four walls. After we leave, after we leave this room, everything is forgotten. Okay? Come on, anybody? Anyone? <laughs> I tell you this, okay? When you said this, I like your comment, but I tell you, when you said this, uh, the guys at the back, you know, their reaction was very interesting. <laughs> see, see, I like, hear, I like, hear. <laughs> the reaction is like, but it's interesting, okay? But of course, interesting is a, it's a diplomatic word to use, true? Yeah. <laughs> okay, but seriously, anybody who wants to start off by telling me a little bit about your research journey so far, See, if you don't share that, I cannot. I don't know what you don't know and how you've been through, isn't it? Right then, I can't tell you about my journey. Okay. So, anyone, please help me to help you. Yeah, yeah. Please, please, please. You can share. Okay. Yeah. 
interesting topic that related to my field. Uh -huh. What is your field? Medical field. Wow, okay, okay. You are a medical doctor. Okay. A medical doctor. Oh, okay. Yes. So why do you need to do another? Uh, okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Curious now, see. So why do you need to do a PhD if you're a medical doctor? Okay. No, no. I, I'm serious. Uh. I, I asked. Yeah, I asked this question. Okay. Okay. No, no, I, I totally appreciate your point because let me just jump in here. I actually have a few students who are actually good medical, seriously, they're medical doctors. Uh, one is a pathologist, another one is a general practitioner, another one is a hospital administrator, right? They're all doctors uh, and I always ask them the same question. So why don't you study this higher degree in, in a non-medical area? They say, oh, because, because they say that. Uh, I thought it's an interesting journey. That's one, that's one point to say that. <laughs> okay. Because I asked my student, so also he's very diplomatic and polite. He says, it's an interesting journey. He didn't want to tell me that he wanted to change career, you see. Because I also tell him, you know, if you want to change career, then this one definitely is very high on the agenda, isn't it? Right? Anyway, back to you. So, you want to do a PG because? Okay. And the journey was so far? So bad? Or is it so far so good? So <laughs> Interesting, huh? You're not a psychiatrist by any chance, right? Oh, I see. But are you a psychiatrist? So a psychiatrist is those who treat people with mental problems. Right? Because you know why, right? Once you get this thing, you know what it stands for, right? What does it stand for? Wrong, wrong, wrong. <laughs> Seriously, okay? <laughs> because, you know, when you count the cost uh, of all this, I tell you it's high, you know, very high. Because the investment opportunity cost, right? They're not necessarily the same, isn't it? But they can add up together to a much bigger packet. True? Right. So that's what it is. Okay. But well, thank you for that. Now, let me tell you. My own journey, okay, in terms of the PhD and research, I'll tell you this. First, the first paper is the hardest. Second, the first paper is the one that I worked the hardest also. Right? Because I know next to nothing. Right, that's where I depend on my supervisor. Right? But after I did the whole piece of work, I still know nothing. Right? And I don't know why I did it. Because you know why? The system tells you that, oh, before you can graduate, before you can appear before the examination committee, what must you have? Yeah, that's what they tell you. So we all just go and do, you know. You're thinking. And then the worst part is that because you're in a hurry to do, guess what? Whatever your boss says, you just do, right? You know, that's a good soldier. Don't question why, but just do and die. Okay? Second, is that after you're finished, then you think you want to do some more? No. Why? Tell me. The journey, you know, seriously, all of us will come to that point where you question yourself somewhere, whether it's three years, uh, five years or whatever, I got a friend, he did his uh, PhD in MIT. Guess how long he took his PhD? How long? How many who said that? Huh? No, seven. Seven, yeah. So it's twice the length of his undergraduate, you know. So I, I, I didn't see him for a long seven years. So I said, what happened to you? Just, I was doing my PhD. Right? So you know what, in seven years, what he was he doing? Poor guy, he was doing engineering-based PhD, okay? So sitting in the lab, every day watching videos. He's doing machine visioning, is it? So watching videos and say how to capture, how to, how to create vi uh, what video data and all that stuff. So they just do seven years of his life. You know? So what? You know, I'll tell you this, okay? He 
his journey was lonely. Why? Because he epitomizes the typical PhD student. He talks to only one thing. Guess what? He, who he talks to? Or what he talks to? Sorry, what? The who we know. He talks to his supervisor once a week. Okay? The what he talks to is what? He talks to a computer. Yeah, the machines, that's all. His lab, you know? And then the worst part is that even though there are people, fellow PhDs in the lab with him, guess what? They don't talk to each other. They don't socialize because they say, this guy could be a potential competitor to my ideas and my topics. And this is true, right? I'll give you an example. Uh, about 24 months ago or so, remember, or last year or so, early last year, remember the case of this guy, or this lady, young lady, what did she do in Stanford as a PhD student? You know, to make sure that she's the only one in the race to get a paper published because they're working in roughly the same area. She went to put poison. Yeah, to go and feed to her other fellow PhD, right? It came on the news, isn't it? Right, very sad, but that's a fact of life. Right, so the journey is a scary journey, you know, that you can go cuckoo, you know, before you even get this title. Literally, you know, because you've got mental problem. Right, and there are others, you know, that we have, I've seen physically, right? In some places, they take a rifle, go to the office and shoot their supervisor. Because they say what? Or they threaten to say what? How come you never let me pass? Simple question like that, you know. And the supervisor said, but you know you cannot pass. But you think the guy knows? No, because his journey was a journey of one. True? As in one person. And because the journey of one, it becomes a lonely individual journey. Literally no one to talk to. Even if you have someone to talk to, I'll tell you this. His girlfriend or boyfriend or her girlfriend or boyfriend would have left a long time ago. True. Imagine, you got a girlfriend, no? every day you can see your girlfriend, what do you talk about? Wow, man, I tell you, you talk about, hey, today I found the R squared or the P value to be 0 0.01. But, you know, my, my, my supervisor tells me, P point, 0 0.01, not good enough. You must now get more data, make it 0 0.001. And the girlfriend say, okay, this is lunch, but he's talking about P value, right? Then he might, she might use other P words on him, all right? And then 0 0.01, 0 0.001. They all look at him and say, are you okay or are you just pure zeros? Right. That's what it is, right? Lonely, you know? Because unless and until you work in a PhD lab, no one knows your work. You're just talking to yourself. And your only emotional, spiritual, intellectual, oh, I don't know what, uh, huh? crush is your supervisor. And you find a supervisor has no time for you. Wow, totally finished, right? Because the relationship that you have built with him or her over the last three to four years suddenly just crashed in front of you. Right? So that's what we do. Right, so as a PhD student, we just do what our soup tells us and then just say, hopefully, the journey will be over. Right, like, first, I tell you this, okay, the journey is very simple. This is like a marriage, you know. Love affair begins, right? Dating, right, now, right? Very easy. The first six months, happy, money, honeymoon period. After that, reality sets in. Okay, when is this going to end? Uh? Journey becomes very quiet. Look around, nobody next to you, nobody behind you, nobody in front of you. You say, hey, am I going in the right direction? True? Any of you asked that question before? Am I going the right direction? And when you start asking that question, I'll tell you this. It's good news for you. You know why? When you ask that question, I'll tell you, you're not at your midway point. The halfway point of your journey. Because if you don't ask that question, it means you have not arrived at that point. Right? And once you've gone beyond asking that question, then I've got better news for you. You know what is it? The end is in sight. Right? But the N is inside. Doesn't mean good, huh, by the way. In the PhD journey, the last thing you ever want is what? To know that the N is inside because you have made it so, or because the system has made it so for you, could only mean two things. One is that you're really finishing and going to graduate. The other part about the N is inside is what? Somebody wants to terminate you. Because they will tell you, your progress is not good enough, right? So that's why in some schools, especially in Australia, where I had a chair there a number of times, um, they'll tell you this, okay? In the Australian system, they will have a, a system such that halfway through, they need you to have a mid-candidature review. Right? And that's where then they will estimate, they will determine your progress and say, can he or she make it? So we will try and buck um, I help the person to back up, so to speak. Because if you really can't make it, then as a supervisor, I will have to make sure that 
you actually must exit the system in the most painless way possible. Now, of course, why is that so? Because as a supervisor, now I'm taking the role not as a student, but as a supervisor, I have a vested interest. You know what's the vested interest? It's a selfish interest, you know, mind you. My vested interest is what? What do you think my vested interest would be? Anyone? You're now the student, but now I'm telling you, look at it from the supervisor's perspective, which in this case is my perspective. What do you think would be my vested interest in this journey along with you? What do you think would be? Publication is one, yes, what else? What else? Sorry? What, what, what? Patterns, yeah, but this, this is the secondary outcome. But what is the core, the two core interests? One is publication, right? If I'm a research PhD supervisor. What's the other one? Yes? Correct, Lord. Then I will scold you and say, wow, you know, you took so much of my time. You know, I, I, I had opportunity cost in spending with you, and yet you still can't graduate. Then I'll be cursing and swearing at myself and say, what did I do? Right now, invested in men who said mentoring just now? Huh? Yeah. yeah, in mentoring you, and yet you still cannot progress. So, as a supervisor, and I'll tell you this, okay, in most systems, especially in the US, in the Ivy League schools, they have a big vested interest. Two, one, what you all said, publications, right? If you, as a student, cannot help the supervisor to publish, I'll tell you, the US professors will not look at you too favorably in the Ivy League, right? Because they also. When they embark on their journey, just as you as a student, right? The problem with them with it is that you, when you finish your journey, when they embark on their journey, if they're choosing, if, if you're choosing an academic career, you'll be on that journey for the next 30 to 40 years, right? The longest surviving academic that I know, he's also from MIT, by the way, but not in management, he's in civil engineering. His name is John Newman. He's already in his early 80s. He still holds an office in MIT. And by the way, he still publishes. Area. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I tell you honestly, okay, I will stop publishing by a certain time because I'll say I'm out of this game. Right? I won't call it a journey, okay? Please, huh? And I, I'm not, I'm making no apologies for it. I say I'm getting out of this game, not a journey, right? And those who understand it will know why I use the word game instead of journey. Now, but back to the supervisor. So the supervisor, that journey will say, hey. I want to take students only who can help me meet my cause and not what tarnish my reputation. Where's the word? Ah, right now. The reputation must have a little smiley inside there for a very important reason. The smiley is that I'll tell the world, I'll tell my competitors, I'll tell my bosses in the university system, I'll tell my potential employers in other universities. Say I have done so many PhD students and all of them graduated, not just graduated, right? They have also published papers, good journals, and not only just that, but, but they graduated in double quick time. True? Right? If possible, if the tenure is four years, I tell them my student published and graduated in less than three and a half years. Wow, guess what? The journey of the student right now is used to serve the purpose of the supervisor's journey. True? So you see, yeah? Conspiracy theory again. Okay, and I, make, I, and I will apologize first to those if I'm going to offend you in this room here. But sometimes, you know, we forget whose journey is more important. Right? Is it the journey of the student or is it the journey of the supervisor? It is much as we would like to think that it's a symbiotic relationship. But I'll tell you this, the relationship is not balanced. It is not always even. Right? The relationship can tilt in many ways, right? So you got to be careful. But I will also tell you this: if you find the right supervisor, then your journey will be one which is not just only productive and hopefully, yeah, hopefully, okay, it's a productive but harmonious. True that. Right? For those of you who are students who have gone through a very tense time with your supervisor, you know what I'm saying, right? Sometimes your relationship with your supervisor can be quite, you know, you know, adversarial, right? So it must be harmonious and engaging because 
Why? You are not just getting a person to talk to who understands your problems because he's the only one who understands your PhD problem or your research problem. Your wife, your husband will not understand. Right? Why you spend time here? Right? They look at it and say, oh, what's happening? Right? But engaging because you're going to engage in deep intellectual discussion. Right? And that's where the value comes from it. And after that's done, please make sure that in the journey, you continue to build a collaborative relationship with your supervisor because you can still continue to publish. And you know what's good news? Every supervisor will tell you this. If you get a good student, then you don't just get a good student. You get many good grandchildren. You know what I mean, grandchildren? Because if your student is also going to be an academic, then you can bet your last dollar. His student or her students will work with you too. Right? And that's why we talk about grandchildren. Right? And so, in some fact, disciplines and mathematics, they've actually tried to build the genealogy of academics in the journey. Right? So that's the journey. Now, the next question, in terms of journey, and that is that, how long should the process last? How long should the journey last for a PhD? What do you think? How long should the journey last? Don't care about the system. The system will tell you this X number of years, right? But how long should the journey last? Sorry? Two years. Okay. I'll tell you my experience. You know? For my journey, it was very simple. For six months, I floundered looking at a topic. Couldn't get anything. Worked very hard, you know? Six months, never go home. And of course, I told you, right? My six months, my social life was not just zero. My social life was negative. People thought I died. Literally. Right? Because I saw no one. For six months, I stayed in the lab talking to a computer. In those days, it's not a colorful uh, Microsoft screen. It's the worst screen ever. You know? It's a green, monochrome screen that has got white words coming out. Wow, I tell you, it was really challenging. Six months, you know? And then people think, wow, this guy, whether he went home, we don't know. But he didn't, did not shave, right? because that one you can tell it's a physical appearance that will show, isn't it? Right? And whether he's been sleeping, we know because he's not been sleeping, he's got panda eyes. Right? All those things you can tell. And then they also can tell that I've not been eating well. Why? Because what? The telltale signs of food wrapping, McDonald's wrappers, and everything, what have you, KFC, all by the side, all over. But I'm still on the chair. And then the worst part is what? If I see someone uh, coming close to me or sitting on my chair, guess what I will do? I go berserk right now. Because why? I've established a territory around me, the little space of one meter square. That is a no-fly zone. Literally. No one can get in. Right? Because I'm still looking at my research, focusing on it. For six months, no results, you know. For well, testing time, trying time. After that, I decided to change topic because I said, this is getting me nowhere, right? And I'm not going to just write one paper after three years and then say, oh, no, pardon my expression, and then say the four letter S word, right? I say, what the heck is happening? So I changed. Then after that, guess what? Lo and behold, you know what? Within the next six months, one paper came through. And you know what happens in my journey? The one paper came through. Even though it's not the best of journals, because my supervisor asked me, so where do you want to publish this piece of work? I thought he was joking at first, you know. I said, you know what I said? Difficult answer is any good student would have done. I said, depends on you, Prof. I told him. Right, because I told him, point blank, I'm happy that I managed to get some results. That's the first thing, right? Because I suffered during the process, but now I saw an outcome. Then he said, okay, let's write it up. And he asked me, where do you want to publish? I said, I've got really no idea where's the best journal. And I told him honestly, he said, Right. I'm happy I got up to this stage. If I can get it published, I don't care no, anymore. Because why? I got results. To me, it's finished, right? But you know why he asked that question? You know why my supervisor asked that question? It's because of the thing that I told you earlier on. His reputation is at stake right now. And he also wants to score some points on his own reputation and say, I got a good student, I got a good paper. True? So a good student is necessary, but the good paper is the sufficient condition to show his credibility. Understand? Yeah. So that's what it is. So we just say publish and then straight once I publish that, that's it, no? I know my PhD was done. 
the system will not give me any what problems, right? Not so, and also that not only that, I don't have to attend any need Canadian review anymore, right? Because I cleared it by default. I got a paper. Wow! I tell you. So in this process, who is happier? Let me ask you. In this journey, who was happier? Yeah, <laughs> not me, you know. Because why? I tell you. After a while, I'm, you know, once you're into it so much, okay, you lose sense of perspective. You just want to get it over. But I tell you, the supervisor was the chess master. He is the one who's really happy because my soup engineered everything, right? He literally engineered everything, even though I was struggling with the with the, the modeling. You know, I had to call him. Right? And you know, as supervisors in Australia, this you have a privilege. You know, you have one day in a week where you can actually don't have to work in the office. You can work from home. And guess what they call it? Well, you know what they call it? Working from home. They have a nice euphemism or term for it. They call it your research day. Basically, they say, I'm not going to come in. Right? I don't get paid a lot, so I my weekends are off. But I can selectively choose one day in a week to decide which day is out for my research. So nobody can disturb me. So I had to call him. And guess what? When I called him during my journey, right, when I was desperate, you know what he was doing? You think he was doing research? Answer is no. He was in his garden, tending to his plants. Then I said, I didn't want to tell him, but in my heart of heart, I said, wow, how I envy him, man. This guy is just so relaxed, and here I'm suffering. But when I call him, he seems to have all the answers to my needs and my worries and my concerns. He was very calm about it. He said, okay, do this. Let's see what happens. And true enough, I did it, bang. My results came out within two months, paper done, finished, accepted. Within a year, yeah, finished, cleared with PhD. That's all. Right? So, the journey becomes very important. Right? If the stars, okay, if you believe in that, if the stars are aligned, wow, you got it made. But if the stars are not aligned, then my other friend, uh, the MIT guy who did machine visioning, uh, machine vision, right? Seven years now to clear his PhD. And you know what's the irony? This is a digression, huh? The irony is that then when he finished, he came back to Singapore to work. I saw him uh, after six months, and then one year later, he died. Seriously, died. Why? Because this guy is very smart. He's got a philosophy. I told him, I asked him a very dumb question once. I said, Look, I asked him, I said, where's the best place to sit in the plane? You know what? It's a research question, by the way. Yeah? Okay? It's a research question. Where's the best place to, where is the best seat in the plane to sit? I mean, which seat is the best? Do you know? No, uh, the back is the best, correct? correct. But his, his philosophy is a bit different, okay? His philosophy is that sit just next to the wings. Then you wonder why. Then he told me the answer. He said, Do you know that the fuel of the plane, they're all stored along the wings? Of the plane. So if there's an explosion, you'll be the first one to go. There'll be no pain and suffering for you. Hey, but I tell you, uh, this guy, I, I, I take my hands off to him. I salute him and I respect him because he actually practices what he preaches. Guess what he did in the SQ6, uh, SQ006 situation in Taipei years ago? His plane crashed. That was the first SQ incident. It crashed and boom! And guess what? Row 31A, 31B, 31C, all three die at the same time. And you know who they are? Mother, wife, and him. Wow. I mean, they couldn't identify anybody in the whole row, you know. And only him people identify. And then they found out there was a the whole family because of his, what? The teeth, the dental record. Right? So, another research question, okay? What's the best way and the fastest way to identify the date? Well, seriously, you're silent. Where's the medical doctor? What's the best way? Is it by dental record? It's all burnt? In an explosion, right? So they identified my friend uh, through his dental record, you know? Literally, then they found it was him. And then they verified. Then after, they can bring the bodies home to a burial. Right? But it's a research question, right? Is there a faster way to identify a dead person? Right? When it's completely burnt. Morbid, but researchable. Okay. So, journey. Now, any questions first? Are we still good on time? Who's the timekeeper? Oh, so fast. Okay, fine. Okay, so now, pitfalls and challenges. Um, the first pitfall is that don't go to do a PhD thinking that you can change the world. Seriously, okay? 
Because I'll tell you this. In fact, I can tell you by asking a question. Today, how many PhDs graduate globally each year? How many? Give me a number, don't give me thousands, okay? Just give me a number and I'll give you a hint, okay? The number is as good as your big sweep number, as in the number of digits down there. One million. At least, yep. Globally, yeah? All the universities. Yep. Crazy. Of course, when I say the PhD, it means it could be a PhD or a DBA, yeah? Doctor of uh, Business Administration, because Harvard doesn't have a PhD. They got a DBA. So a million. Now, how do I know that? Very simple. Uh, this is 2018. So 2015, I sat on the university committee in Australia to appoint and select 20 postdocs for the university's new drive to become a research intensive university. So I was part of the uh, selection committee. And I'll tell you this, my brief was very simple. To select only three people maximum for the discipline of supply chain and logistics. And I had to look through 978 CVs because we did a global search. That was a mistake I felt. Yeah, because it consumed two weeks of my life. Literally two weeks of my life, right? Because you spend so much energy writing your CV, your position statement, and why did you get a job? Obviously, I must do justice to your submission, right? And read it. But of course, our way of doing things is a bit different. I have uh, admin support to vet the thing first. But even after vetting, I'm still stuck with 978 applicants. I read the first 10. I said, hey, this is not going to stop, you know, because it's just fast closing date. It is already 10. And I asked my admin person, I said, how many do you have in store for me? He said, another 960 over. My jaw dropped. I said, if this is going to go on, first, I'll miss my deadline. Second, I'll miss my time to write papers. Third, I'll be utterly miserable because I'm going to play God, which I don't want to play God. Right? So I created a system and said, how do I select? How do I select candidates so that I can read, I can read them out as quickly as possible? First answer is very simple. I look at the papers you have done. Right? How many papers? I look at the quality of papers. I look at the papers you have in your pipeline. And I look at what are your goals and aspirations. Some people after finishing a PhD, guess what they want to do? They just want a job. Right? They never think anything else because they need a job. Either to pay off the money they've invested in or what? To tell his, their friends that they got a job. Right? So four things. By, we, by doing all that four straight away, I weeded up a lot of uh, chef or shaft, right? Then I had about 55 to read. And that's why I spent two weeks seriously reading their CV. And not only that, not just read their CV, but I read every one of the papers they have written. Literally read everything and find out what exactly they are doing, right? So, if you think that the journey was tough in the PhD, then the next one I'm telling you, in terms of the pitfalls and challenges, getting your next job is even tougher. Because, in as much as it's tough for you to be accepted as a candidate in any university to do a PhD program, it's also going to be tougher for you to be accepted to be a faculty, right? In any university, as in an academic faculty. In the case of management, we could go the way of the physical and natural sciences. What is it? In the physical and natural sciences, when you finish a PhD, today it is expected they don't jump straight into an academic position straight away. They have to serve time. What does serve time mean? It means that they have to become postdoctorals for three years minimum. Of course, you might ask, why? Right? The answer is very simple. They feel they do not have enough papers. So they will use the three years to write like hell. Right? Good papers, many papers, show the strong pipeline. Those are the criteria, the three criteria that we're looking for the first three. Right? So they can show to the potential employers that they are worth considering. But you know what? The sad truth is that because they spent three years doing research, guess what? Some universities, for one reason or another, put in a little caveat to protect their own. And what is the caveat? The caveat is as follows. If you want to be an academic staff, research alone is not good enough. It is sufficient, no, it is necessary, 
but not sufficient. What is the sufficiency condition? The sufficiency condition, they say, is that have you got any teaching experience? True? True. Wow, so, so I tell you, it's a very strange thing because one of the postdocs told us that in the interview, you know, will I get a shot to do some teaching? Then we all wonder, hey, you're coming in to do a research postdoc. Why do you want to do teaching? Then he explained to us in the interview, he said, oh, actually, I want to go to a teaching position, right? This university, I actually applied, he said, I applied, but this university told me, I must have teaching experience. So they asked, he asked us in a specific interview. So we had to then quickly think about it and then adjust it, adjust our rules so that we allow these people to just not just do research, but also give them 15% of their time to teach a course during the whole year. So that will show them or show the world that they've got some teaching experience before they can qualify. Right? So that's how this whole thing works up. So what am I saying? In terms of pitfalls and challenges here, you know, your journey, if you mean you clear the PhD process will not end there. There will be much, much more. Okay? So be careful of that. All right. I got the last one. Now, can I have the papers up there? Okay. So. Oh, by the way, in terms of pitfalls and challenges, I will tell you this only, okay? That your challenges, the longer you stay in the system as a PhD student, your challenges to enter the academic world will only grow. Right? It's not going to be simplified. It's not going to be reduced. Even though countries are building more universities. And you know the reason behind it? The short answer is very simple. Because the existing faculty will not want to give up their positions. They will stay for as long as possible. Especially in the American system. Right? Once you get tenure, you're not just tenure, but you're tenure for life. Right? And for life means you can work for as long as you want. I got a friend, he's Australian, he's an academic, right, in Australia, uh, he's lucky, he doesn't have a PhD, he only has got a master's in information systems. And today he's uh, 79 years old and still working, right, but he walks very slowly, right, he walks about, I don't know, 0 0.3 meters per second. Okay, work it out. Okay, fine, let me now go through this. I'm going to now take the five, next five, ten minutes to show you two pieces of work that I've just uh, looked at recently. Then you see whether it makes sense to you, whether you still want to be part of that game. Okay, we are waiting for technology to boot up. And a timekeeper, please let me know, all right, whether I've exceeded the time. But I, sh I like I said before, I do wish you asked me questions, you know. Then that would maybe help me to keep me awake rather than to fall asleep. You know, it's not tough. Huh? For me, it's tough to, to have a horizontal meditation. But it's easy to have that vertical meditation, which means I can sleep while standing. Okay, are we there? Yes, the color is almost there. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, ba -ba 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 I'm going to spend about 10 minutes to dissect three papers very quickly. I don't have enough time, but let's see how it goes. Um, okay, good. Now, this is the title of the paper. I think you have already, isn't it? You have a copy? Yeah, okay. Now, tell me, what do you observe in this first paper? What can you observe? Do you know a paper like this? Have you read it already? If you have not, it's okay. Don't read. I'll tell you this, because every paper should only be read by a few people only. The author, the editor, the reviewers, throw so together five. Don't ask your wife to read because if you ask her to read, she'll divorce you for sure. Okay, at least for this paper. Huh? Okay, come, anybody. Hey, by the way, I chose something close to home for you, huh? as you can see. Huh? This is the nearest I could get to. You know? There's no paper on PJ, uh, but there's a paper on KL. Come on. Do you know what's happening? <laughs> That's an honest person. <laughs> what idea was happening right now? Huh? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. How many, how many moons ago? 30 years ago, right? Okay. Good point. Huh? I'll, I'll KIB that 30 years ago. Fine. Yes. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's the title only, huh? Okay, we're reading the text, right? Okay, fine. Okay, now, thank you for all those two comments. I think they're very good because it helps me to bring it together. First one is research, huh? right? Even though we have studied this main area, yours is electrical engineering, right? Yeah, even you studied this main area 30 years ago, I'll tell you this bad news. Research is always fast evolving. It's changing, right? And that's where it goes back to my earlier point. Why why I put up pitfalls and challenges, the P's and C's? Because you must not have the mindset that what you've done, what you've learned today will be relevant 40 years down the road. You have to change. Right? I'll give an example. My own journey. When I first, my first did my first piece of empirical research, it was actually on simple exploratory factor analysis. Right? And guess what? I did the first piece and I, I won a run-up paper, you know, for the second best paper in the whole year for that journal. But today, any PhD student who comes to me and say that, hey, Prof, can we publish a paper on exploratory factor analysis? Guess what's going to happen? You'll say, what are you talking about? I'm teaching my undergrads now, that one. Or worse, in 10 years' time, they'll ask you, what are you talking about? Now, the students in uh, university and pre-university are already learning that. Get my point? Right? Because research has to push the frontier. It has to always progress. So what we have learned 20, 30 years ago, unfortunately, cannot apply. Because if it does apply, then you're not really doing research because you're regurgitating. Right? What you want to do is be at the cutting edge. So that's the first thing. Second is that, I want to show you this paper for a simple reason. How do you get people to read your papers? That's what I'm saying, right? Now. For you, you have to read the title and guess, right? Because that's what it's trying to tell you. So, learning point. In the title, you must make sure that you be as clear as possible so that the reader, when he looks at it, before I mean to read your text, he can roughly guess. Now, what does roughly guess mean? Is it 5%, 10%, or 95%? 95% probably not. You don't want to put your trade secrets in the title of the paper, right? But he should be able to guess 50% what you're trying to do. Agreed? He should be able to guess 50% of the time what you're trying to do. And if you look at this, Research here, which what year is this? I forgot already. I think it was a very ah here, here, here. See? Received 2016. So barely a year and a half ago. Right? So what does that mean? The world of research is actually very competitive in terms of challenges. While you can think of a topic like this currency issue, I'll tell you this. There will be at least another one million folks outside there somewhere in the system thinking about the same thing. Right? So what do we call them? We call them the research vouchers. Seriously, when you present your piece in some of these conferences overseas, there are people who are very keen to listen to you. Actually, they're not listening to you. Guess what they're listening? Listening to your ideas, waiting to take it, park it somewhere, write it as fast as possible, and publish it. But of course, here we sit very dangerously on the side of, on, on the uh, box of ethics, right? Whether it's ethical to do it or not, I don't know, right? The British system is that if I tell you an idea, right, then you should respect that this idea came from me. Even though if you can write the paper, either you can choose to work with me or you acknowledge that this idea came from me. But in some younger scholars today, right, they listen to an idea and then they claim credit for the idea. What does claim credit mean? You look at this. Next line. What's the surname of this author? What's the guy's surname? Tell me. Is it really Kaboli or is it Ake Kaboli? Okay. I give the guy the benefit of the doubt, right? Let's say it's Ake Kaboli. So, what is the house rule? Again, in the very traditional mindset, old school. What's the house rule? If the paper is but jointly and severally contributed, what should it be? It should be yeah, at all, or alphabetical, right? Yeah. But you look at this. The first letter of the English alphabet is unfortunately A. Huh? So maybe that's why his A came out instead of Kaboli. The second letter is a B. Now, following that, I think F is how many? Yeah? A, B, C, D, E, F. Six, right? Six. After F, 
Does R come before S or S comes before R? What happened here? What happened here? Okay. Hey, by the way, wait, 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 before I forgot, very important, I forgot to ask. Do you know anybody here? <laughs> you know why I asked that question, right? Because they're not very far away, isn't it? Yeah? They're not very far away. Still, they're still alive. Okay. So, here, what do you think happened? Who is the real, who is the real worker? Who is the, what should I put, the free rider? Sorry, not the one. Very crude, but no choice. Who's the real worker and who's the free rider? Oh, who's the supervisor? I'm not saying supervisors are free riders, by the way. Huh? Not necessarily the same, okay? <laughs> uh, no. 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 Who's the real worker here? The real worker, okay, I tell you, uh, this one here is a, was a PhD student, UTM. This one here, not sure. I also don't know. I would like to think that he's also a PhD student. Now, why do I say that? Again, this goes back to my journey. If you have supervisors who are nice, what would they do? Even though their surname is comes first yeah, in alphabetical order. If they are nice, then what they will do is they put your name first, right? As if you're the student. Why do you think they will do that? Because it's just common practice. You, as you begin your journey, your supervisor, your supervisor is the master craftsman, but you are the apprentice, right? So the master craftsman has an obligation to look after the apprentice, right? So that's how the master craftsman will push the apprentice to be recognized within his own domain and area. Assuming that when you do a PhD with him or her, right, you will continue the journey in the broad area of research. Right? So he will look after you. Looking after you means what? In academic circles means that you will try and push the student's name first. Now, some senior authors, myself included, if you are nice, they say, okay, your paper needs to get published, so what do we do? We'll lend some weight to it. Right? You clean up the stuff, we'll put it in, but we don't want to, uh, you know, insist on alphabetical order because it doesn't matter to me, right? I've written enough, so to speak, right? I don't care, right? If you can help somebody, go ahead. But must be careful. Today, there are journals, for example, like um, Intelligent Manufacturing International Journal of Production Research. They've got a new rule that just came out last year. They found a very, very bad practice. And what is the bad practice? The practice is that there are many authors who go in there and put their names just to be a free rider. So now we say, is this name one, the same name as it appeared when the paper was first submitted? Or is it a new edition? If it's a new edition, the editor's policy is very simple. Paper is to be rejected because you forgot to include the authors in the first place. So they question the ethics of it. That's the first thing. The second thing, some of these journals here, what do they do? They will ask you to fill up a new form. The form says what? You have to state categorically the contribution of each of these authors. And unfortunately, in the boxes that you check, there's no mention made that I put my name there because it's easy to do. Understand? So you cannot do that anymore. So the authors, the editors are not dumb. They're trying to close that loop and control the malpractice if you like. Okay? One, two, oh no, sorry, three. Look at this. I want to show you this because this is where the challenge is, you see? They receive it, but in revised form, this. So it's about a good seven months or so. Then after that, review one month later. Well, three things you can learn from here. The first one is that the challenge is that don't expect your paper to be accepted the first time around. Usually there'll be a number of revisions. That's the good news. Seriously good news. In some good journals, you can do four revisions and guess what? The bad news, the worst case can ever happen to you, touch it, touch it, touch it. That can ever happen is what? You submit after the fourth time. Whoa, the bad news comes out and say, the editor is very nice and say, I'm sorry to tell you, we've gone through, we've given you serious thought to your paper, but we still think that it does not merit sufficient, you know, whatever, whatever. So, rejected. 
and that's where you get totally depressed. Now, here, next point. Seven months, is that a ready time to submit a revision? Is it a ready time? Now, that's a very risky proposition because this is a very hot area. Long-term electrical energy consumption, formulating and forecasting because people want to know that, countries want to know. So many people are doing this research. For seven months to do a research, guess what? In the seven months, there can be another 1,000 different papers. So in doing your revision, the longer you take, means that you have to recognize the other work that is also in the pipeline. Right? So it's a no-ending story to your literature review. Okay? Fourth. This is the worst, the worst, the worst, the worst. <laughs> what do you think happened between 2nd of February, was that 2017 and 2nd of March 2017? What happened? Who is the donkey now? 2nd February 2017 and 2nd March 2017. Who is the donkey? The donkey, my friend, is the poor reviewer or reviewers. Because then they have only one month to turn down your paper, you know. Right? Because once you can accept in, in revise on to the reviewer, the reviewer gives a good report, guess what will happen? In the four days, the editor's job is made easy. Right? He will just look at the reviewer's report, go to the reviewer he trusts the most and say accept or reject or revise. Then, in this case, accept 6th of March. You think the editor did all work? No. The editor just relied very much on the reviewer. You think the reviewer did a lot of work? Probably yes. Right? Because he's got an obligation to do a good job. But is it fair for the reviewer to only spend one month to look at someone who spent seven months of his life to work on the changes? Right? Uh, that's the question that we're talking about. So you see, the time divergence or the time convergence of getting a paper to print from the idea and so on and so forth to the final piece of work is getting shorter and shorter. What does that mean? The challenge for researchers today is that you want to not just publish or perish, but you got to publish faster or perish faster than you like. Okay? That's what it is. Huh? Okay, so that's enough for this one. You can have a look at the paper, it's there. Now let's go to the next one. Also on the energy domain. Okay, now you look at this. I don't care about the rest. Okay? Okay, that's good enough. Stop. Now, comments on this in relation to the first piece that you saw. Any response? What? Why? That's what? The first one, right? Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. So now, tell me, you think this is a paper by the same author, or you think this is a paper by a different author, or you think this is worth publishing? As in, is this a trivial question they're trying to address, or is this something that's going to be earth-shattering and can help industry because it's got the term called electrical energy consumption again? Three questions I pose to you. Any responses to that? Yes? Anyone? Yeah, correct. Just looking at the demand side, right? But it's just cutting the problem into different parts, isn't it? So it's like this one here that I talked to you about, the A, B, and C. So, now, good point. Some people have a practice, and what is that? They say, I collect data, 1,000 data points. I can cut the database into several parts. And this, by the way, is not new. Huh? The medical doctors have been doing that for many, many years. They collect one huge database, for example, in the US, where right? they got SPSS General Survey, right? They put everything inside, and they cut every year, they produce different papers out of it, right? Like many papers, right? And they cite different things. So they look at different parts of it. But now let me ask you, when you look at this as a reviewer for this paper, what is your first impression? That's very important, isn't it? Because that's where you learn about the research process. As a student, you only do what your supervisor tells you. But once you reach a stage of not being a student and moving on to your career, you have to understand and say that, hey, you'll always be meeting this request to review. 
That's the first thing. Second thing is, how do we tell whether this paper warrants publication? It's a judgment call, right? That's where you have to, unfortunately, play God, right? No. Third, countdown to goodness. Wow. No, that's not my third. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that was not scripted, by the way. Okay. Now, here, you find that now the techniques have changed, but the main area is still the same, long-term electrical uh, energy consumption. Now, I purposely took out the author because there's the issue of ethics here. Now, I'll tell you this. In here, there's only one author. One author's name. In the earlier paper, there were how many? Four, right? So all got taken out. So now, what happened? Tell me. I don't know. Lah. Or it could be that this guy maybe learned enough of the technique, decided not to rely on his friends or his co-authors. Remember I told you about the issue of ethics, right? My policy is very simple. When I start something in someone, in a research area, we'll, go, we'll, we'll see it through, even though he might not have worked on it in the second paper, a lot of it, but I'll still feel indebted to him for discussing the ideas in the first paper, right? And then put his name into the second one, right? And so on and so forth. Because it's seen as something that we have so-called co-birth together to produce a baby, right? Now, here, unfortunately, as you can see, there's only one author, right? And I won't tell you, for, for, to protect this person, I won't tell you which of the one authors, all right? Definitely not the supervisor, okay? Because if he does it this way, then I tell you, the whole community will be on his back. I say, why do you do it that way? Okay. Second is that, <coughs> which is a more interesting paper? This one or the first one? Now, what are we doing? What am I asking? I'm asking a very important question. In today's game of research productivity, research impact, this thing called citation count becomes extremely important. So now, the question is, when you write a paper, usually it is the first paper that gets the most impact and get the most cited, the best cited paper, right? The rest is not so important. It's just like, you know, remember this guy, the management guru who died in 1993, December, Peter Drucker, right? His paper, his book on management, actually is one of the best cited books compared to any of the academic journals. Why? Because he was the one, the first few to write a decent book on management. And so every scholar would have cited his work, right? Like it or not, right? Whereas in this case here, you do this long-term electrical energy consumption. Bang, stop here. Hey, this is very, it's exactly the same as the first paper. So what does that mean? It means that few people want to read this one. They want to read a seminal piece and just a add-on piece. Okay? So bear in mind. Huh? Okay, now, let's go to the next one. The third paper, very quickly. That's three minutes. I'm going to change that in case you don't like this. Okay, let's stop here. Now, Look at this. When you look at this title, what is your impression? Does it make sense? Sorry? Yeah, English is poor, correct. Right? Because you look at this and say, if I were not to pick out the English and look at the keywords, I will say, okay, this is a topic on knowledge management, it's a topic on strategic management process, it's a topic on Indonesian SMEs. But what's the guy trying to do? Right? And you think about it. My impression when I look at this, my first impression was that was it a translation from Bahasa Indonesia? Right? Yeah. Was it a direct translation through Google Translate? Right? That they took in, boom, and it came out. And I said, wow, what am I supposed to do? Okay, then you look at this. Okay, let's go down to the abstract, don't mind? Okay, let's stop there. Now you look at this. So this guy obviously is trying to do some research, but, 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 okay, there are challenges. For example, there's a little thing called construct here, called competitive intelligence, which he threw it in, but never explained it. But you put in the abstract, hey, you're going to get help from the reviewers, right? Because the reviewers will never say, never like this idea of throwing in the construct without explaining before, right? Because this is an abstract, not the paper itself. And if you look at all this, he's talking about a very popular technique in empirical research that we used in the last uh, three years, mediator, moderator approach. Now, let's go all the way now, we jump all the way to the end, to the end where the diagrams are, figure, I think figure one and two. Last page or second last page. Oh, some more, yeah, okay, some more. And this one, I thought it's crazy. Look at, okay, yeah. go on, go on. 
Go on. Okay, go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Okay, that's good. Some more? Go down. All the way down. Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. Eh? This is... Some more. Just scroll all the way down. Okay, some more. Go down. Pass the references. Pass the references. Some more, some more, some more. Uh, okay, uh, is this down? Where's the go down? Some more to page 20. Yes, page 20. This 19. There's some more. I want to see the figure. The last page for mine. Okay, stop. Look at this. Is no doubt standard reporting, but the problem is this is not good enough for a journal today. You got to go more than that, right? More fanciful statistics, unfortunately. So that's the danger of doing empirical research, right? And the second part about this paper is, you, as you went down just now, as you scroll down to this last page, you find that the references is crazy, right? You know, this guy I think had about sixty-eight references for a paper. So now let me ask you a very honest question. How long would you take to read 68 papers in full and understand those papers completely? One hour? Two hours? Okay, okay, fine. You need a measure strong. Not hours, right? One day? Two days? One day, one paper. So how many days are you going to consume just to read? 68 days. <laughs> you know what happens now, right? By the time the 69th day comes, you try to write and do your uh, survey. This is a survey piece, right? Do your survey, do your analysis. I'll tell you this. Game over. Because why? Someone else has written something already. Right? And that's the scary part. Now, you know what's the reality? The reality is this. 99.9% .9 of these people who write the papers, they do not read the references in full and complete. In short, what do they do? Title, abstract, abstract keywords, keywords done. done. And that's why in some journals, they have this first page to support your paper, right? They say, can you put in the purpose, your implications, your methods, and the value of paper, isn't it? Right? So that's why they ask, because they only read that first page. Right? The rest, they actually did not bother to read. Okay? So, two papers we've dissected and discussed. Okay? So I'll leave it to you to think about how you approach your research thing. Now, the last thing I have for you for today, before I close off, I can catch my flight. Any other business or any other points that you want to raise? Any other things that I can help you answer? Are you good? It's okay, if you are good, then I'm good. I don't understand between you. Oh, yes, sorry. On the, is there any effect that um, the passion you have for that industry have to make the road easier? Sorry, you got to, not that you got a mic, I got to listen to your voice before you had the mic. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, I was saying, I'm referring to your previous um, topics on yep. how tough the journey is, uh -huh. and uh, I'm about to embark on this journey. So I want to ask, is there any effect on the the passion you have for the area of research, does it have any effect to make the road easier for you? Uh, yes and no. Uh, short answer to that is yes and no in the sense that if I send a paper, if let's say you write, send a paper out to review, and if your co-author is an established name in that area, the reviewers would know because you've probably written enough papers around that area. So when I look at the paper, I, I'll tell you roughly who has done that work, and 90% I'm there. I know who you work with in that sense. Right. The second one, in term, I assume you're talking about authorship, right? Yeah. Uh, the second one refers to the kindness of your authors. And sometimes, you know, I, I don't care. I mean, I, I'm not going to be fast, but alphabetical. What's more important is, you know, if you're a PhD student, it doesn't matter whether your name comes, you're a Z or whatever, or a Y. You know, you, you, it doesn't matter if you put your name first or whatever. I'm okay. In fact, if anything, I'll take the same cue that my supervisor did for me. It means I'll put your name first. As the first author. Why? Because in some countries, the system is that 
they'll tell you, you know, when they apply for a grant, they'll tell you this, that I'm the first author. I or they, in some places say I'm the contributing author. And what does that mean? It means that basically they did most of the work, right? But to me, it's very different. I would say, you want to work with me, can. But it's a proviso. You put your name first, can. It's a proviso. What is that? You handle all the admin, the reviewers and the editors. That, because that is a tougher one. And simply because the other part for me is very simple. If you ask me to handle, I probably will lose track and I'll be lost in it because I, I'm too busy to handle all these emails that come in. Right? So that's what it is. Right? So you have to discuss with your authors. And as a simple word of advice, not, not that you ask a good question, usually it is good to sit down with your co-authors and establish a relationship in the beginning before you even start the research. Because if you don't do that, then later things like this, like for example, the first and second paper, right? It will happen, and it has happened already. Huh? Okay. Any others? Okay, no more. Okay, sorry. I think in the interest of time, I have to pause here. Yes, yes. Uh huh. Supervisors should do. Uh. Oh, I don't know. I am a bad supervisor. Okay, because I scold my students. <laughs> <laughs> and my students know it because if you come and show me nothing, right, don't come and see me because I will give you trouble. And if you show me things on the spot before preparing me ahead of time by sending me a soft copy, they also know that I cannot give good advice and my discussion with students is very short. My, I tend to request students to send stuff to me at least two days before. So I will read, I will read in the thing and then they know that I've read it. And if I call them up for a meeting, they also know that it's bad news. But of course, I would like to think that when I meet students in the corridor, they don't look at me and they throw away do an about turn and walk the other way. Right? Because then I don't distract hell in them, but I want to make sure that they enjoy the process. But good supervision, I think, is that we owe it to the students to help them publish and publish well and help them on their academic career if they choose, so choose to be academic, or if not, help them to find a good job in industry. Okay, so with that, I think uh, I, my time is up. So let me just uh, thank you for your patience uh, for sitting through all this so patiently, right? So till we meet again, I'll see you. Thanks. Thank you, Prof. Marco, for sharing your valuable knowledge with all of us. Could we please have Professor Salopin on stage to kindly present a token of appreciation to Professor Marco? Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. I got caught on all this again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, professors. Let's now have a short break for 15 minutes. Refreshment is served on your left. We will recommence in 15 minutes, which is 12.30. Thank you.